<laughs> it's like, it's kind of, we get a sense that this is like the re French Revolution for programmers. Like, you just, every, every manager you're just off with their heads, which sounds really nice, but like, is that a fair rep representation in a way, or is Well, it, first of all, it is, it is a really nice environment. I mean, it really does yeah. work and work well. Um, and a lot has to do with just making sure it gets set up right, or just, I, I, frankly, I choose clients which I can be successful with. Um, wow. So if I walk into an organization and they tell me all the reasons it's not going to work, you walk back out the door. Right. You, you know, yeah. Don't spend your time there. Uh, but certainly, when I went to work for Mail Online, it was a deliberate choice that says, uh, I think I can make it work in this environment. And this is like the antithesis of a startup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought so as well. And if you can make it work in this environment in the startup, then all those naysayers that says, you know, some of these things don't work, it's a little harder for them to say that. They'll still say it, but it's with less credibility. Uh, but yeah. was it that mail, mail themselves were ready to change? Yes, and that was one of the things that was kind of important. Um, and again, they'd had two CTOs. They both had failed and fired. Uh, the new CTO uh, was actually, the guy was an amazing sort of architecture mind. Obviously, he's a Node programmer. He'd been writing some of the Node code that they're actually using in production for monitoring things. Uh, so very hands-on, so you know, there's a lot of affinity for that style of working. Uh, and he had, he had a, a, a charter from the managing editor of the paper that says, Fick, do the, you do the technology. I'm not going to get in your way. Ah. And basically, there was no other decision maker above him that could say, don't do this. Uh -huh. uh, and to be fair, you know, he, uh, I sort of, I signed up pretty easily after that because he apparently described me to his uh, vice president as the hand grenade he's throwing into development. <laughs> <laughs> and with that sort of charter, I, you almost couldn't turn it down. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I, I liked your description when you said that you, you, send, send, you send yourself in to like, fix yes. stuff and then get out before you break it again. Well, it's, it turns out that's kind of, a, it's actually a formal role. I mean, it's a formal role called change agent, uh, it's uh -huh. described in the literature. Uh, I think it's really nicely described in a book called Lean Thinking with Womack and Jones. Mm -hmm. And they talk about the need to have a benevolent tyrant yeah. coming to an organization to make these sort of changes. But he's very clear. It says, there's a footnote to that that says, and tyrants are always shot. Right. <laughs> uh, so I recognize that's kind of what I do. Uh, I go find one of those chaotic situations or complex situations. Yeah. Uh, you fix it, but then you almost, you know, by radical changes, throwing titles away, ripping desks yeah. out, putting tables back in place, uh, training people without any regard to their former titles or, yeah. or, or sort of status in the organization. Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty important to realize what kind of person you are, I think. I mean, some people are perfect for you know, going in, changing everything, and others are much more comfortable and much better at like maintaining and gradually improving something or keeping it going once someone has. <laughs> Yeah, I, and I, recognize, I, I, can, I can recognize these issues because I've yeah. had, uh, a, you know, I'm old, so I got a breadth of experience. So I, I, had, I ran an organization at IBM in, in, the in the 1980s that had over 250 engineers. And if you carved us out, we were, we were in the top five, you know, largest programming shops in the world in terms of profitability. Um, and so I had a lot of exposure doing that and talking to, you know, really extremely sound IBM executives about you know, strategy and tactics and, and what, what, how, you, how you explain things to executive levels. Got a great background in that. So when I came out and I dressed like a programmer, <laughs> it's, it's to some degree a lie because I'm also a general manager. I could, yeah. I could walk around equally with a tie on and, and a three-piece suit. Uh, and the nice thing is you, I can walk into a situation you recognize that this is, this is not a, a technical issue. This is a organizational issue or this is a leadership issue or this is a... Uh, it is a people issue. Yeah, right. I mean, that's such a, such a big thing as well. Some people think that everything has to be solved with technology or writing code. But some stuff is much, a lot of stuff is actually about, you know, changing what people it, think about and talk about. And I think to some degree, uh, I think we have a lot of agile failures or very, or very marginal successes in the industry because somebody goes and says, well, we need to do agile. What do you need to do? Well, here's the formula. You go to your scrum master yeah. and you listen to him. <laughs> and so you, you add, you add a yet another manager into your organization, <laughs> fundamentally, <laughs> rather than getting rid of some. Uh, and you say, well, I just have to train the scrum master. I don't have to train everybody else because it's cheaper that way. Yeah. But you, you, again, you're missing the whole point. Yeah, you're just adding stuff on top. Yeah, yeah and so it, it's only marginally successful. And, and you say, well, why is that? Well, you didn't really do it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a guy who actually doesn't believe in the role called agile coach. I think that's it's a huge disservice to the industry to call yourself an agile coach. 
Right. Because um, at some degree, you're, we're doing a sports analogy, which says you're too old to be to play it, so you have to teach it. You're not too old to write code. Uh, yeah. We're much more like artists. Uh, and we can paint and paint and paint until we're really, really old. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can still paint. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I love that you said that you have switched to using closure. And it's like you're still trying like new stuff. But how do you, how do you see about, uh, look at the trend right now to go back to functional programming and, and go back to the stuff that were popular years ago. It's kind of, it has to seem like deja vu in some sense. It, like, yeah, but you, you go back at almost any of these things and you see deja vu. It says, oh yeah, Haskell had that. Yeah. Uh, if Lisp didn't have it, then Haskell had it. And, and it's like, that's not very helpful. Uh, the thing is, we don't teach Haskell. We don't teach Lisp in the universities. We teach Java. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so why are we surprised when people come out and work in a particular fashion? Uh, I do think that the, uh, some of the forces driving functional programming are the, the massive parallel processing we have in L. Right. I mean, we, we're not getting faster processors anymore. No. We're just getting more of them. And we know how, how much you know, Java just loves to synchronize all the processes and flush all the caches you know, every five instructions. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep it from doing that? And a language like Clojure addressed that very eloquently. Uh, mm -hmm. It's immutable. Don't worry about it. You don't have to flush your cache. So sometimes I get a bit cynical. And I start thinking that maybe, maybe the key to success is, is change itself. It's not really what you change to. So a lot of the... Like I guess get the sense that a lot of the methodologies are kind of like fad diets, you know. It's like, it's like if you just change to this like new diet, you used to drink orange juice, you're gonna solve your situation. But actually, what what's what can change your life is to change something and get yourself to think about those things, and and then maybe you can start doing things. Well, and the social literature awareness. supports that as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, I remember we studied in business school that. Uh, a team that's been together more than six months, they've had all the conversations they're going to have. Yeah. I mean, they've uh -huh. settled into a pattern. And so innovation just dropped off, just drops off precipitously after six months. So knowing that, you always keep stirring the pot. In fact, you're right. It's a change. It's changing, bringing new people into the team, of just completely, you know, blowing the team apart, reforming teams. The dialogues happen again, and sometimes the answers are different. Now there's closure available. Yeah. Uh, no. Now there's Amazon available. With my, so all the decisions I made five years ago with this team, not necessarily true anymore. Yeah. So it seems like often what people focus on when they talk about Agile is the, is the process and the development model is, you know, like we have sprints, we have stand-up meetings, and it's all a ritual. Whereas, like, the true, the real thing that's making it work is change and being open to change. And that part people kind of miss. Well, maybe. I, I, also, I also sort of say, you know, process is important. You've got to put the enabling process in place. Right. But then you need to invest in the people. So it's not a matter yeah. of bringing a scrum master in there. It's really saying, spend some time to learn closure. You know, let's learn how to deploy into Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you, you start using Docker for our, for our container environment. Uh, that's very important to get the people up to speed. Mm -hmm. And even that's secondary to the team and the team concept. It says, as a team, let's learn how to work together. Let's have, give each other feedback. Uh, let's allow new ideas to flow. So it's, uh, I, had, I had an old blog I used to write called Process People in Pods. We're saying, you know, that's the order of importance. As you know, you, importance increases with as you move into the into the pods. It's not the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people sell process. I mean, IBM is famous yeah, for yeah. selling process. <laughs> uh, use our process. Use our tools that enforce this process. You'll be better. Actually, what you're doing, you're locking yourself into no innovation. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of like diets, really. I mean, everyone is on some kind of diet because a diet is what you eat. But one diet is not for everyone. And just because you eat a particular diet doesn't mean it will help you. But finding my diet or my process that works for me lets me focus on other things instead and get some stuff out of the way that I'm not as interested in. I would say that people we, I've typically worked with, in a, going all the way back to ThoughtWorks, you know, four or five companies back, uh, I tend to look for two different skills. And so I'm probably selecting for these skills. One is self-learners. Uh, I, you know, having lived through this many, many generations of technology, being able to be motivated to pick up the next technology and try it is, you know, I think, a very key skill to yeah. being successful in these environments I set up. And the second thing is you like to deliver. It's not a matter of just playing with the tech. You actually like to get something out and people using it. Yeah. Right. So I don't, I don't care if you're a university graduate or you've been out there 50 years. Uh, if you have those two skills, this is a really ideal environment. 
And it almost as people that don't fit that model get very uncomfortable and will leave the organization pretty quickly. Right. Uh, yeah. if, you're a, if you're a Java Spring programmer and that's what you learned 10 years ago and you're still <laughs> writing and you think you're going to finish your career that way, do not come join my team. <laughs> no. Uh, you will not be a happy person. Uh, no. So do you think people can change? Like when you, when you get into an organization, there's someone struggling against you know, the things you want to do? Well, there's, is, there's, there's two things. That, you know, again, Mail Online is a bit more of a radical but recent case. Yeah. Uh, there were, uh, were a sizable part of the IT organization that left when I came in. And within, within a few months of my coming in and, and saw the trend where it was heading. Because yeah. uh, they wanted to be still, I want to be an operations guy. I don't want to be a DevOps, I want to be ops. Yeah. Or I want to still be a QA. Uh, so they, the ones that don't want to change, they kind of filter out on their own. Yeah. Uh, and you attract the people that sort of meet the criteria you're looking for. Yeah. So it's a bit self-filtering in that. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people out there that you know, want to earn the paycheck, this is a job, I have other things I want to do. Um, so yeah, I want to be an ops guy, I want to be able to run Unix servers the rest of my life in the captive environments. No. Good. I'm glad yeah. you enjoy doing that. Uh, we may need you one of these days when we get that, but otherwise, you're not going to fit in my, my new world. Yeah. So, how do you feel about remote work? Like, distributed teams and remote work? Do, do you think that's good for agility? Like, you can, maybe you can be more flexible in how you put your teams together if you can bring people together all over? Or? Well, well, certainly when I was in Outpace, we didn't have any two programmers sitting in the same room anywhere in the world. Right. Uh, so it was 100% remote. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about putting an office in Chicago because we had enough programmers in Chicago, and they basically told us to go to hell. Because <laughs> uh, you would create this environment where some people are having conversations. We talked, we had lunch yeah. together, we talked about this. We'll tell you about it later. Yeah, right. exactly. You feel like they're second class citizens. And so they were very adamant we will not do that. Yeah. Now, to, re but to sort of bring back the social nature, we did man mandate pairing. pairing. Okay. So we, we had a remote pairing. It works really well. Um, I mean, video feeds are such that you can run a video feed with a two meg upload speed. I can share my my screen with you with a two meg upload yeah, speed yeah. with you know less than 100 millisecond latency delay, so you can tackle my screen. Yeah. And we felt that pairing was the replacement for that social thing. I, we may have hired you. I know you're a smart guy, but unless I'm pairing with you, it really doesn't stick. What you really know. Yeah, yeah. Um, Make, makes a lot of difference. And so I was sitting there in in a very comfortable office in, in my little home office and all my screens around me and you and I were working, you'd be, you'd be logically sitting beside me because you're on my side monitor here. Mm -hmm. And we needed to have two other guys join us and we just they just joined into the same Google Hangout and now there's four of us sitting around the table having a discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these we could be sitting around the world. Um, that was actually worked amazingly well. Yeah. So we finally got together. I mean, we got together the first time physically Half the programmers I never met in person. Yeah. Right. But there were no surprises. I mean, I knew exactly how they thought, what they thought was funny, what they were really good at, except yeah. for some were really tall, some were really <laughs> fat. Yeah. Uh, we had one young lady, and she was like, she was like 5'10". I mean, yeah. she, was, she was really tall, and just like, wow, I didn't realize that. This other guy I thought was like six something, he was just really skinny, <laughs> a little guy. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, like you, you can never, there's always something that surprises you when you see someone in real life. But, it, but it, wasn't how that, it wasn't how we interacted with each other. It wasn't what no. we thought about. It was, it was just those superficial things yeah, that yeah. were kind of interesting. Uh, yeah. So I think it actually works really well. Uh, but you really have to create the atmosphere that the rogue guys are just not sort of subs in some way, but they're sort of first class on the team. Yeah, and that's a difficult thing. I mean, we have a bit of that problem at work. We're a pretty small company, so we have basically one developer who works. It doesn't work at the same office as the others, and that's kind of tricky. Because, yeah. It is tricky. Uh, I mean, there are guys that work well that way. That, yeah, yeah, definitely. And there, you can certainly find little things for these people to do, but maybe not as significant as, yeah. as a core team. Yeah. So you, there's some use of that, but... Uh, yeah, but we certainly have that communication thing all the time. It's like three people talk about something over lunch, and oh, yeah, we, we have to remember to tell him as well. I mean, communication theory comes back as well. If you, know, if you and I actually work closely together and establish that rapport, yeah. I can go somewhere else, and we'll yeah. still have really good communication. And it, it has a half-life of about six months. Yeah. Six months from now is about half as good as it was when we were sitting together. And that becomes a point where you kind of want to renew it. Yeah. So I come and live with you guys and, and work with you guys in the office for the next two weeks, and then it refreshes that, and then I can go off again. Yeah, yeah. I, I've run a lot of remote projects where we had a large number of programmers in India and some in the States. And we were separated mm -hmm. by 11 time zones. Right. Um, <laughs> so almost as bad as you can possibly get. Yeah. But we would have some of our Indian programmers in the States, and we would, you know, for three, four, five weeks at a time, and steal some of their business analysts and programmers from their site and bring them and send them in mm -hmm. India. 
Uh, the site was in Minneapolis. You couldn't get anybody in the summer because it's nice. But in the winter, it was not a hard argument. <laughs> uh, they were willing to yeah. India, let's see. How cold? How, what's yeah, it? yeah. It's 25 degrees today. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the plane now. <laughs> uh, That's great. So, yeah, I think remote is, is the way of the future. Uh, I think yeah. uh, you know, places like Silicon Valley, programs are extraordinarily expensive in Silicon Valley. And frankly, they don't provide the value for that price. Because right. I can go yeah. into a place like Chicago or... Or you know places like uh, St. Louis, Missouri, which is where Strange Loop is. Yeah. Some really bright people in that in that area. Yeah. You can hire these guys for a fraction of the Silicon Valley guys and give them a high standard of living. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. You you know about working remotely. You do it. Yeah, yeah. I work in a team that's completely remote. We don't. No one's in the office. We're spread over pretty much every time zone in the world. So, it makes it difficult to arrange meetings, but it's also kind of liberating because you never. You're never having to be in the office at a certain time. Right? Yep. You can set your times. So I assume you don't pair. No, nothing like that. No, but so it's, it's, it's a, at least within compatible time zones, it's actually quite powerful. Yeah, yeah. It would be nice to do more of that. Uh, it's kind of the thing that I would like to do, but yeah, it's kind of tricky as well. So so far, we were kind of constraining ourselves to the four U.S. time zones. So we were in Canada, mm -hmm. several time zones in Canada. I went down to Mexico to look for programmers, mm -hmm. uh, and we were interviewing programmers in South America again for because the time zones are compatible. Yeah. yeah, I guess if you spread out more, you have to hire a couple of people in adjacent time zones at the same time or something. It certainly helps, although I, I certainly, I, when I was sitting in California, I would get up at seven o'clock in the morning and start pairing. Yeah. yeah. And when they had lunch, I'd go get a shower. Yeah. Because that was you know, time to get a breakfast and shower. So we, you, you work out those little, yeah, little, yeah, little sure. fine points. So certain offsets work be better than others. Well, we also had an attitude that we, it w wasn't sort of a sweatshop. When you, when you yeah. got tired of working, you stop. Yeah. You need yeah. a break. And so uh, sometimes you have some stuff to do on your own. But so they would do things before, in the early hours on the East Coast, and mm. I do those things after after the East Coast hours are yeah. closed down. I do my little things. Uh, That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the way of the future. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, especially since the technology is kind of catching up. Like yeah, like video conferencing is really nice now. And it's getting very easy to communicate well, even though you're in different locations. And we're in a generation where you know, quality of life is, is much more important than it was when I was starting out, where yeah. it's like yeah. your career is first, and then you worry about you know, your family second, and then you have hobbies, okay, they're number three. Yeah. Uh, this generation is not so willing to do that. And no, I, but we have the enabling things that allow them to make those choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I can take two hours off your commute every day by having you work at home, uh, yeah, you're fantastic. pretty happy. Yeah, <laughs> everyone wins. Really? So you're still enjoying programming? I am, yep. What do you do for fun? Like, do you I play computer games. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, yes, I, I, I had an original Pong game. I mean, as soon as it came oh. out, I had that one. Every yeah. generation since then. I started my European tour by going to DreamHack in Stockholm. Oh, yeah. Oh, Starcraft. <laughs> nice. Uh, one time I was trained myself a professional Starcraft player. That was only a oh, year right. or so ago. Uh, I do play Skyrim. Uh, that's oh, what yeah. I do on my long air overseas flights. You play Skyrim to mm -hmm. pass the time. <laughs> I'm up to over 2,200 hours of Skyrim. Whoa. <laughs> so that's, that's my distraction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love Skyrim. That's actually, I have an Xbox 360 and I only have Skyrim for it because I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> you can't finish it. No. Uh, it. It actually generates new levels and stuff all the time. Yeah. But, uh, so do you ever get interested in, in making games? Is that something you've been looking into? Or well, I think for, trying for, for the longest time over the years, they pay gaming developers very poorly because yeah. they, they write the games. What's, what's, what's the, and now you look at it, and something like Skyrim, you look at the credits, and it's producers, yeah. it's artists, programmers build some interesting tools on the side, but I think the days of a programmer going off and writing an amazing game, uh, those are pretty much past. I, th yeah. I think yeah. just by law of large numbers, it happens on in, in uh, the iOS you know, shop, yeah. the App Store. You can find a lot of interesting iOS games written by one guy. Yeah. But there are another 10,000 that are completely dumb. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it's basically a lottery. Like, you can write a game and it can be great, but who knows? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I do think about it. I, I, I do, now with the new metal interfaces on iOS and, and we got Swift, I'm thinking about building a strategy game on an iOS yeah. platform. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, have you looked into Swift? What do you think of that? Uh, I have. In fact, I attended the first Swift users group in Palo Alto. Yeah. Oh. Which was completely useless because nobody knew anything. <laughs> what had been shipped, and we just were swapping trade rumors. I, yeah, I heard yeah. this. What did you hear? Uh, there was nobody from Apple there, and it was uh, yeah. no, not available. No. But it was it was hilarious. It was like completely useless. Yeah, we're all on the same level here. Nobody knows anything. Yeah. I did attend the session here about Swift, and it's like, oh yeah, we, now we know lots of stuff. Yeah. So it, it looks pretty cool. Uh, 
at least I think it makes it easy to me to write, a, write an iOS app now versus yeah. what it was. And I, I do keep all the uh, seminars and stuff from the Palo Alto user group because they're yeah. getting into here's how you use metal with Swift and, oh, nice. and topics like that. So, yeah, yeah I'm going to get the itch one of these days to do that. So it's kind of between Swift now and Elixir are my languages I'm playing with. Oh, yeah. right. You've been looking at that as well. I've also checked out Elixir. And I think it, it's nice to see lots of new languages again. Like, it, it seems like there was a long time where there was not really anything except uh, C++ and Java. And then, uh, like, you were too you let it shelter with life. It was small talk. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I mean, of course, there was before that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when I was in school, university, like, you learned Java and you learned C++, and that was basically it. And uh, we yep. did learn a bit of a ML and Lisp and things like this, but they were all more like architect, like historical artifacts. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of reviving again, which is which is really interesting, it's exciting. Yeah, and I think Elixir kind of made my radar because I was at a presentation with Pragmatic Dave Thomas, and oh, and nice. he was saying uh, it's most funny he's had since Ruby. I'm like. That's enough for me. You know, <laughs> if you're having fun with this language, that's my criteria. Let's, yeah. let's pick it up and yeah, play What else it. do you need to know? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, and it's brand new, and it's functional. Uh, yeah. and it looks like the learning curve is way less than the closure learning curve. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm feeling, and, and of course, you know, the Erlang virtual machine environment with the thousands and thousands and thousands of threads running mm -hmm. parallel on a notebook. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that sounds like my microservices at some level, too. Yeah. So it's an interesting architecture. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, can you describe what that is? The microservices? Yeah. Briefly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In two uh, well, it basically is kind of taken the service concept, which has been around now for, oh, it's been you know, well over 10, 15 years, uh, and just kind of keep rationing it down and taking advantage of yeah. the fact the cloud's there now. And you can write very, very tiny services very and run them very economically. Uh, so not having to worry about hardware budgets and capital equipment and I IT stuff and so enabling you to sort of deploy very quickly has driven us to write smaller and smaller things. Right. And so um, microservices pretty much taking the concept of service and treating it almost like we would a class in object design. Right. It does one thing, one thing only. Mm -hmm. It does two things, write two of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and encapsulation comes to fruition. Uh, basically, if you have a service, it has its own persistent store. It needs to remember something, it has its own store. And it turns out maybe one service in 10 needs to write to their store. Right. Most, service, most services just need a key value store. That's all they need. Yeah. And maybe only one out of 100 is actually transactional. And so you're not stuck with having to have a transactional database for all these services just because right. one out of 100 needs it. And that's encapsulated. So I can change my schema. I can change tech, database technologies, put another version out there without having to impact the rest of the enterprise. Uh, yeah. And so it's, a, it's an aspect of going faster that we discovered it forward. Uh, yeah. It's how fast you can push this. So most services in forward were 100 lines of code or less. At the Daily Mail, it was 14 lines of code. was an average service size. Oh, wow. Uh, so cool. it does one thing. Uh, Maybe not even if statement. Yeah. If it's so short, it's like, why do you need a unit test? You know, unit yeah. test will help you to refactor it. Yeah. It's 14 <laughs> lines of code. Just write it again. You, yeah, uh, you, you know, look why, at it. <laughs> and if it's written in a language you don't understand, it's, it's still, it's 14 lines of code. I bet you could understand if it's written in Python. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just an algorithm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was interested when you, when you started talking about fear as the main problem with development and like overcoming fear and I feel if you can pare, pare things down as much as possible like make things as simple as they are fine then you don't have to be afraid of them either you don't have to be afraid of changing them and you don't have to be afraid of uh, like like you say testing is basically just looking at it and saying, oh, and I, think, I think a lot of success was we also put in fast failure so almost yeah. the first service we wrote were monitoring services looking at our KPIs and stuff like that so if you have a KPI monitor out there showing you how your clicks are running, yeah. and you make a change that kills it, and they, they start dropping, it's like, okay, yeah. I, I figured that out really quickly. This is a really bad yeah. idea. Uh, and that makes you more fearless. It says, I can try yeah. something, and I can just sit there and watch it for a few minutes and figure out whether it's good or not. And if it's bad, back it off. That's yeah. much easier than writing a unit test or, or an acceptance test or going through that protocol or having a meeting about it. I mean, none yeah. of those things make sense anymore. Yeah. So yeah. we don't mind failure as long as the cost of failure is manageable. Right. Yeah. And it seems like so often the fear of failure makes you put in more layers between development and deployment, which mean, makes you so much slower in fixing problems. It's probably the biggest change sort of in the, in the project manager role, originally in Agile, is yeah. um, when things went wrong in a, in a waterfall process, which was modeled after civil engineering, you put another step into the process uh, right. to make sure it never happens again, which links to the process. Yeah. If you're a manufacturing engineer, you're like, I don't want to make more steps. I want fewer steps. Mm -hmm. I want parallel steps. 
Yeah. And so the reaction of a manufacturing to this situation is, how do we, you know, make, how do we figure out what this mismatch was quicker, yeah. rather than put, a, put something in permanently to make the process longer? Yeah. Uh, so that's sort of a huge mind shift uh, in how you would manage an agile project versus how you manage waterfall. Right. Um, and you're right, the first thing you do is make sure it never happens again. It's like, no, we, we don't mind it happening again. Oh, that's wrong. You have to make sure it never happens again. <laughs> we have to have a process, a sign-off. Um, um, even in the Daily Mail when I was there, the, uh, I was sitting in the CTO's office when I was interviewing the job, and, and along, along comes a guy drops a paper on his desk, and I'm saying, like, what is that? Because I'm suspicious. And it's like... That's uh, to, for me to sign off the next release. Oh. And, I, and, I'm, and I look at him quizzically. He understands exactly why I'm looking at him. It's like, yeah, I don't read these things. I just sign them, you know. <laughs> and I, so I made it very clear that if ever one of those showed up on my desk, I was going to walk to the shredder immediately. And none of them ever showed up on my desk. So nobody ever asked me to sign off of anything before it released. Uh, Wonderful. But that's what you have to sort of do as this benevolent tyrant. It's yeah, like, yeah. you know, you sort of say, that's not, we've got to stop doing this. No. Uh, this is just and then nobody misses it. Uh, yeah, of course. So do you think that's key to succeeding with this kind of change in an organization, to have someone like you to come in and not be tied into the organization so you don't have the fear of saying, like, no, that's bad, and that's bad, let's change those things. Like, you're open to saying those things. And, like, you kind of need that to be able to do this kind of Well, changes. I think what Mac and Jones says, I mean, they have much more experience. They, they think a change agent is a critical role. Yeah. Uh, it's something... And, uh, and they're very frank about it. You, you will get shot. No. Um, so it's a very, it's a very transient role. Um, and I've recognized that if I stay too long, I become the lightning rod for the counterculture to stop it. You know, let's go oh, back yeah. to waterfall. Let's go back to titles. Yeah. And if you, re if you get an organization running this way, you remove yourself, and they don't have really have anybody to argue with. Um, yeah. And <laughs> yeah, that's a good you know, if, I'm gonna, if I want to be in a company a long time, you know, my changes will take longer to put into effect. Uh, if I'm charged to make quick changes, you know, I make, I'm clear up front that I'm going to upset people. Yeah. Um, and, and my tenure is going to be relatively short. Yeah. Uh, despite how much you want to keep me around for long periods of time, my tenure is going to be relatively short because I, I basically will have driven myself out. Yeah. Uh, it's your job. <laughs> it's my job. Yeah. Uh, so I, remember I did this in uh, even ThoughtWorks uh, India. Uh, was, oh, yeah. was there to sort of begin, you know, push really hard the agile practices and get them upgraded in their agile practices. And, uh, you know, six months later, you know, they were, they were doing it, doing it, like you said. I mean, I, I argued for, you know, pair programming and titles and, you know, getting, getting rid of the titles and got a lot of stuff put in place, but there's a lot of people that upset by that. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I went back to the CEO and says, it's time for me to go. And he said, no, you're really important. No, you don't understand, Roy. <laughs> I, I burned bridges. It's time to get me out of there. Uh, right. yeah, four weeks later, he says, it's time for you to leave. <laughs> I told you that, yes. <laughs> so... Have you had any failures? Like, is there an organization where this kind of methodology just doesn't work? I haven't, but I, I do self-select these projects based upon enabling them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I can, if I can find sort of a core of a, core of a team that is, is passionate for delivery and, and self-learners, uh, if you can find the C-level, top-level executives of the company that are comfortable with what we're going to pull off, uh, you'll be successful. Yeah. Uh, so I've always been successful in those environments. But partly is because I'm using the gray hair. It's, <laughs> When I say something, people believe me because I got gray hair. Yeah. If it looked like you, they would say, well, uh, what do you well, know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, and we can say the same thing, and they won't listen to you. Uh, uh, so I think that's, that's an advantage to that. It's, it's also recognizing, you see, walking into the CIO's office and dragging her to the, to the, to the, to the uh, showcase. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It did that a couple of times with a client. And, <laughs> and after, the third, after the second time, she would not miss this meeting for the world. <laughs> I mean, it was a positive meeting. She learned an amazing amount. Progress was, was rapid. She wouldn't miss it for the world. Right. And once she understood that, everybody else around us says, wow, this, this stuff must be pretty cool. I, I should probably do this too. Yeah. And we have to, had to actually slow down the adoption of Agile because we couldn't, you couldn't handle changing that many people that quickly. Yeah. So that's what you want to create. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is the main thing that you're missing from, from programming or, or the business right now in general? Like, is there something you wish was different? Mm. I don't think I can think of anything off the top of my head. Let me think about that question. So, I noticed that you mentioned that you, you started using Clojure, and the previous failures in the business were, were rewriting in the previous languages. And you also mentioned that you were trying to get rid of Java at your workplace and kind of 
brother. What is wrong with Java? <laughs> That's my question. Ah, what's wrong with Java? Um, most of the time, you're, when you're writing Java apps these days, you're usually you know bringing in frameworks like uh, you know, Oracle request buses and yeah. and all this other stuff. And, and it turns out this this is just a massive overhead that makes it very difficult to change a program. Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to write a program that makes it very very easy to change. So the newer languages are better for that. Uh, yeah. uh, I think the microservice environment is better for this. But we, I know guys out there that are you know, starting brand new projects, they're writing it in Java, they're using you know, all the Oracle tools. And as far as I'm concerned, they're building a legacy app. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yet they say, well, this Java has this huge following. Yes, <laughs> it's at the end of life. And every yeah. end of life has huge followings. So, yeah, yeah. You know, look at COBOL. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think to some degree, I certainly lose battles in these transitions. Yeah. Uh, but I always win the war. Uh, <laughs> so you lose the battle, you're like, yeah, okay, I, I know I know I have another way to attack this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the Java stuff died out on its own accord. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think one of the problems with Java is that one of the focuses with, with making it, at least that's my impression, is to have reusability. Like you can make all these modules and frameworks and you can reuse them for different projects and so on, which actually slows you down because Every time you start a new project, you pull in all these uh, dependencies, all these modules, all these frameworks that have all these old ideas. So you end up not doing something new. You end up doing the same old thing hooked up together in a new way. Mm. Yeah, and you can certainly write microservices in Java. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're writing 14 lines of code or 100 lines of code. You know, maybe <laughs> it's 200 lines of code in Java, oh, but yeah. still. <laughs> it's hard to still... do anything in 14 lines of Java. But... <laughs> yes. Uh, you can declare yourself existing, and that's about it. Yeah. Uh, but, but, it, but to be fair, the IDs generate a lot of that code for you. I mean, you probably don't have any more keystrokes writing this stuff in Java than no, you're no. writing in Ruby no. uh, because of you know, how powerful the IDs are. But that's, you need an ID to generate all this code for you also. It's right. kind of negative yeah, sign. It takes a lot but, longer to read it afterward. Yeah, and I, so I think it's, a, it's much more an architectural statement. Um, yeah. you, you, you see people using Java now. They're probably building what I would consider the legacy apps, the big apps again. Uh, it's where mostly the guys that are driving this, this sort of architecture are architects. And they right. haven't written code in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so they haven't been exposed to web. They haven't been exposed to how to exploit Amazon. Um, and they don't want to take those chances with that stuff. So their architecture reflects something that's quite ancient. Yeah. Um, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. So it's not really saying Java's evil. It's more or less saying that architects who use Java to build old projects is evil. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe that the. Um, the mindset of, of Java and the Java world is kind of too rigid. It's just too many, because I think maybe in the same way that when you make changes in an organization, maybe it's not the actual changes you make, but the changes themselves that are key. And if something's been around for a long time, there's a lot of like old ideas in there. I, I think they're, they're organizational principles you want to follow. I mean, the flatter organization is a key principle. If you've made a change from one structure to another equally hierarchical structure, I don't think you see the benefit just because it's a change. Yeah. Um, the, inhibit, the fundamental inhibitors are still there. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, somebody was relating to me after a presentation I did yesterday about, you know, there were 22 people in the room and none of which, there was, there was a guy who was responsible for uh, you know, the database, and it was the database manager was with him. And it was like yeah. every one role had a corresponding manager sitting in the same mm -hmm. room. And it was the, sort of the compliance guy who was just there to make sure everybody did their stuff as well. <laughs> and the guy in the room going, and managing him as well. Yeah. And the guy was looking around and says, how many people in this room do work? Uh, <laughs> and it was way less than half. Uh, yeah. uh, so a ch changing from one organization to another is not going not to influence that. Right. It goes back to sort of architectural principles. What's your organizational principles? You know, Low-level mm. decision-making, innovation, uh, fear of failure mm. or not fear of failure. Uh, so what do you think of these organizations that have all these levels of management? I mean, I saw this wonderful picture of a team at Microsoft once where they had everyone in the team lined up and they had basically four rows of managers and then one row of programmers at the bottom. And it's like, an organization like that, are they just doomed to fail? Like, is there any way to... I mean, you, well, first of all, you got to understand, Waterfall does deliver. Right. Uh, I mean, I worked on a project in IBM where we had 1,000 programmers, mm -hmm. and it took three years to develop it. Yeah. And we made a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So the arithmetic says that's a very successful project. So it's doable. Yeah. It's just we can do it faster with some of these other techniques. 
And in most cases, businesses that are doing it the old way are getting hammered by businesses that are doing it faster. And that's what the C-level executives want to understand. So how, how can I be as fast and, and agile as some of these other companies? And so they're willing to make those changes for that reason. Not that the fact that they're not working, but the fact that they can work better and more yeah, effective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in general, that means there's a turnover at management level as well. Um, yeah. You can't hire a CIO today who says, I don't believe in agile. No. Uh, none of them would ever say that. No. Uh, and they're pretty adamant. They do they seriously believe in agile. Yeah. But to some degree, they're, they're clueless on how to modify their organization to encourage the agile nature. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's easy to get stuck in <laughs> what you have already. Yeah, and I think it comes back to that fear thing. Is that if you're going to be able to change things, you actually have to be ready to change things. Yeah, you, yeah I think you find that the you know, CEOs are pretty, you, certainly new CEOs are pretty good about willing to adopt changes. I mean, yeah. it's just a matter of can you tell them how to, how to make it happen. Yeah. And, and these, are, these are large organizations. They're like large ships, you're, and you're the captain of the ship. You can stand there on a bridge and yell, go left, go left. Mm. But unless somebody's paying attention to the engine room, you don't go left. No. Right. And so you spend a lot of time in these senior executive positions basically presenting to your own company, here's a vision, here's what we need to accomplish, mm. and sort of help them get on the same page with you. Yeah. And yeah. then you start making the personnel changes to put the enablers in place and get rid of the people that are slowing you down. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's hard to walk in the first day and say we're going to be an agile shop even if you're a CEO. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's almost impossible with that position. Uh, so to me, a lot of the agile stuff, like um, you, you mentioned, you didn't use these exact words, but there's a saying that worse is better. There was these uh, papers during the uh, Lisp years in the 80s when, you know, when, uh, when the Lisp machines kind of went away. Uh, there was a guy, I don't know if you know, uh, Richard Gabriel. Uh, he was one of the drivers behind uh, Lucid Emacs. He wrote this paper called Worse is Better, where it's basically saying that C and Unix won because they're worse. They're not trying to solve everything. They're just releasing stuff that kind of kind of solves the problem. And, they, and I get the feeling that um, Agile is quite, quite a lot about that, is to accept that worse is better. That you, don't, you can't really get things perfect. I, mean, I think that's key, and that, that's what sort of freezes a lot of companies. You look at, say, Facebook versus MySpace. Yeah. I mean, MySpace owned that, that, that dom domain, right? the whole, whole concept. And Facebook was successful. And it turned out it's because the programmers were basically unfettered. Uh, yeah. they, they, you know, they make a lot of mistakes. You see it in the press all the time. Facebook did this, your privacy is yeah. all compromised, or they did this to you. You have to say your real name now instead of your fake name, and yeah. that's going to expose your sexual orientation. Yeah. And, <laughs> And it's like, who's watching these guys? And the answer is nobody. Yeah, um, that's the way it works. That's just, and that's, and that's actually why they're very fast. But if you're looking, if you're sitting in the MySpace side of this equation, it's like, oh yeah, this is a feature in Facebook. Let's put it in our system. When, when can we schedule that? Let's put a plan together. Yeah. And by the time they roll that plan out, oh my God, they have another feature. Let's put a new plan together. <laughs> and all of a sudden, of course, you go away. So, yeah. you know, speed, time to market is huge. And, yeah. You know, and it, it is a result of basically, you know, not trying to get perfect, trying to get something out there and try to see what happens. Um, Google is famous right now for hiring uh, project managers who have almost no experience in the domain they're working in. Right. And the idea is these people don't come in with prejudice about what the answers are. They read the data. So they make decisions based upon what's going on, not based upon their years and years of experience right. of doing this domain. Right. And so they're claiming that's quite a successful combination for them, is that these you know, product owners, product managers don't have a background. Yeah. Um, On the other hand, they still have managers. Uh, would well, you, would you not, say like, it's not a perfect world, yes. And oh, yes. Yeah. I, I would definitely say that. Yeah. I mean, I think there's two key roles in successful teams. And one is a visionary that has some idea what you want to accomplish. Yeah. Not all the details are necessary, but a guy you can look to and says, yeah, that's, that, we're heading in the right direction. And if somebody else in the organization is keeping the code absolutely gorgeous and easy to change, yeah. as, this, as the vision sort of forms itself, all the other roles you can snap in and out. Yeah. So it's not that we don't need the, you know, we definitely need these visionaries. I mean, Outpace was you know, one third of these business wizards. I mean, they were truly wizards that were t telling other companies how to work better. Yeah. And we're the experts in that. So they're truly the wizards. And we backed them up with two thirds of the company being these killer programmers. Uh, yeah. uh, that was sort of the magic formula for Outpace. So those two roles are kind of key, and those are basically the only two roles we staffed in, in, uh, in Outpace. Right. If you don't have a visionary, I, you know, sometimes I've had to be the visionary, the guy who at least puts it out there, whether it's right or wrong. It's, having no vision is useless. Uh, right. Um, 
And I don't mind doing tactical things, but I want to make sure it's tactical. You know, we're doing this not because I guess it's there, but it's a, we can make some money here. It's not going to last very long, but it's a, let's grab some money right now. But mm -hmm. understand, we're going to throw that away because that's not heading here. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't kid yourself about that, I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah. yeah. I get a feeling sometimes that, um, or I think I think it's a fact that programmers like to write code. Like that's what we do. So immediately when there's a problem, the solution is to write code. And it can be the case that you're kind of too fast into jumping into dry, writing code, and sometimes you just need to slow down. And I get the feeling that the agile process is kind of you can kind of get on this train. It's just like you have to make the next sprint, and you have to write code constantly. Would you say that there's like maybe every project should start with just everyone not doing any coding at all, just hanging out for a few sprints and then you start? Or nah, that's a waste. It's a waste of time. Yeah. I do think it's important to start a project with a very small number of people. Right. Uh, never more than four. Right. Uh, and I've had teams that say, "Oh, here's a team of ten people." So it's fine. You take these six. You worry about these. I'm taking these four. We're going to go do something. Yeah. Um, and I think you add people in as you, as you have productive work for them. Because right. uh, you have 10 people and you're trying to get something started and, and you don't have productive things for them to do, morale goes to hell. Right. Uh, and you're wasting a lot of money in the process. Yeah. Um, but I think the first three or four guys like that, they form their core culture. Yeah. Uh, and you influence it as you bring new people into it, but it's just an influence at that point. Um, so, yeah, there's, the, the team needs to gel at some level. And I'm certainly a fan that once you build up one of these teams, don't reform the team when the next project comes along. Bring the work to the team. These guys already know how to work together. Roles have been established. Yeah, you need to stir a few resources in there to keep it fresh. But the core team and, and how they work together, you don't want to go through that gelling time again. All right. Uh, but certainly, if you start a new project with new people, and we did a lot of this in ThoughtWorks, you know, a bunch of strangers show up one day. We know we're, we know we're, we're hired. With, we know we're smart. We never work with each other. It's like, OK, who can do what better? And, yeah. and you may have spent two, three, you know, sometimes six or seven weeks before your first real code rolls out. Yeah. But I think that's not because we need, I think it's because we need to gel as a team. Right. You need to get um, to know each other. And, or, or the, you know, I, I think we should go this way, you think we should go that way, and we have to sort of have that little dance to figure out which way we should go and right. come up with some new idea. Um, so I'd like to smart much smaller than that. And if, if possible, start with a team that already exists. Uh, I, it's one of the things I also propose that we, you kind of have these core pods that you would form teams around. And, Right. And maybe half the team is actually kind of already there, and you always form more people around them and assign them to things. And you'll say, oh, no, it's too complicated to keep track of. It's who's working with each other. It's like, we got computers. You know, this should not be <laughs> rocket science. Yeah. But yeah, I had trouble getting traction with that idea. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, we did this at, Alp at, Alp at uh, Outpace. You know, teams are relatively stable because they've got to work together. Same thing with Daily Mail. Once the team works together, you, know, yeah. you keep them together at some point, roll members in and out periodically. So have you heard of Valve Software and their organization model? Uh, is, um, yes, I mean, they're famous for their you know, publishing their process and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly, uh, and no managers. And, but yep. I think what they do is they kind of reform the teams all the time. But it sounds like you're kind of recommending the opposite, that you should let the teams form themselves and have small teams, but kind of keep them. I, I suspect in practice there's no difference. Right. Um, I mean, once, once we get together and work with each other and enjoying each other's company, we don't want to separate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to pull you off and put you on this team, it's like, no, these are my friends. We work, we work, we work really well together. And, yeah. and in fact, you'll argue that if you pull you out of the team, our productivity is we're going to decommit our dates, and all these things are going to go to hell if we, if we lose you. Yeah. Um, but you know, stirring the pot is necessary. Um, so how but I would say from a social aspect, these teams will, don't, will not necessarily want to change. No. Now, GitHub is another good example. I mean, the guys at GitHub that know that they, want, they got operations responsibility. We got to keep this thing up and running, so they divvy up the shifts among themselves, and they understand how to handle the shifts and coverage. They work that all on their own, no manager required, but but they know this is what's needed, and and they they do what's needed. Right. Um, so how do you handle putting out fires? Like when when there's an emergency and you need to grab people to fix it, like should you have? And these and these teams that love delivery, they want to go work on the fire. Yeah, yeah. If there's a fire, then we we got a fire. Yeah. I mean, one of our practices. Oh. Did it sound? No? We oh, still have still, sound and everything. It just uh, <laughs> the screen camera. went out. So you know, one of the uh, practices we had in forward was uh, you could go ask a guy, borrow a guy from another team without even asking permission of anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to work with you. And, 
And we went all the way to managing director. He says, as long as you don't borrow a guy more than two days a week, I don't even want to talk about cross-charging. Right. So yeah, you're charged, you can charge this guy even though he's not working for you. Don't, tough. Uh -huh. I'm, not, so I'm, I'm not gonna put the process in place to sort of manage that. Because he knew once you did that, there'd be permission, I have to ask permission, let's have a meeting and talk about, yeah. should I borrow this guy? So our, our sort of corporate culture says, if I need your help, I'm gonna ask for your help. Yeah. And it's gonna be a really strange situation where you wouldn't say yes and come work with me that day. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very powerful part of the culture that you can set up as well. And again, it's, it's getting rid of the guys who would want to keep track of that for you, because right, that's something right. for them to do. Yeah. Kill those guys off, and nobody's going to ask, her, to ask yeah, that question. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is one of the cases where my job was to kill the fear. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're not going to cross-charge for this. No. Uh, and that made it possible to take you, and if you wanted to work on something else, put you on this other team, yeah. knowing that if I needed to pull you back for a day or two, there was no issue with that. There wasn't yeah. any hoops to jump through. I didn't have to have any, any pre-agreements pre between that. I'll just yeah. pull you back when I need it. Yeah. And you'd want to come back if something you worked on is broken and they can't fix it. Yeah, you, you're coming back. Yeah. Um, but of course, the most thing to work on in our environment was fires. You know, because fires means we're losing money yeah. or, I, or something's not shipped. Uh, and we were all about the KPIs. Yeah. I think that's one of the final things we did really well at Ford was we put business KPIs as our metrics for the programmers. Yeah. It was about making money, whatever. And we're programmers. We'll play whatever game you give us. We're, yeah. We like games, right? <laughs> If you want to count lines of code, we'll count lines of code and yeah. do that, or class number of classes, or hours, or story points. You name the game, we'll yeah. play the game. Yeah. So why isn't the game cap making money, or yeah, getting clicks, not? or right. something you care about? Yeah. And it turned out when we put those metrics in place, the programmers had amazing ideas about how to make more money or get more clicks. That, that wow, the business said, can you do that? Yeah. Actually, we've already done it. We're already making more money, and they're like. Seriously? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's one of the key things is let's, let's count what's really important to us, and it's not yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah. And I think maybe that's part of the flattening the organization as well, is to give people influence in, in like, the business side as well. It's like if the programmers feel that it's their responsibility to make money, then they will actually care about that stuff. Yeah, I, I think maybe they don't care about the fact we're making a lot of money, but the fact it's the KPI and, and I, I can do it better than you can do it, right. that yeah. becomes the game. It just, yeah. <laughs> The fact is doing something good for the company, maybe not even that important to them. Yeah. Uh, they care the CEO is getting a lot richer? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> they care I made more money with my change than you made your change? I care about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're pretty about yeah. done here. I think we're done. Yeah. Excellent. It's a really great, Thank guys. great we'll talking to you. Talking, talking if you want. <laughs> I start repeating myself after a while, so yeah, yeah. it's good to keep it fresh. Don't, don't we all? It's, after a while, sitting on the spotlights, you get kind of... <laughs> yeah. awesome. They're not too bad, are they? No, it's, no, not, it's not as bad well, as it's been. Great to talking to you. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. Maybe we'll see you here next year. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs>